Hi everyone, I am Janet Spursted, and I'm going to share with you a bit about a new era we are entering and how the events we create play an important role in humanity's success. It's a pleasure being with you today on Planet IMEX. I want to share and thank IMEX for their courage in moving forward and bringing us together. Courage isn't about being right or perfect. It's about being nervous and unsure and doing it anyway. Because of IMEX's passion, caring spirit, and love for you and I in our industry, they've created this virtual experience for us to gather, share, learn, and support and inspire each other. Thank you, IMEX. I'm grateful for you. Let's get started into the face-to-face -face events, the antidote for the age of loneliness. Who was the last person you hugged? If you are like me, it took you a while to think about it and figure out who this was that you were with the last time before we had to separate from each other. I actually had to go back to my calendar and look to see where I was, who was I with in a meeting. Such a simple question for what should be a simple answer, but there is nothing simple about what we're going through, is there? And that's the time we're in, a complex time. And it's because of this. We all know what that is, right? Isn't it amazing? Who knew we would know so much but so little about this devastating, destructive virus? This virus has stopped the world. We are going through a collective grief. This virus has caused us to shelter in place, social distance, physical distance, and self-isolate. Scientists say that this is a part of a new era we are entering. This new geological era is called Anthropocene. It's viewed as a time during which human activity has been the dominant and dominating influence on this planet. Based on overwhelming global evidence, humanity has consumed, taken, used and altered every atmospheric, geological, hydrologic, biospheric, earth system and process. This period of time has also been called the Aramazoic Era. They've coined it the Age of Loneliness. Elements of the Age of Loneliness contain global pandemics we're experiencing now, but also a couple other elements I wanted to highlight. Autonomous technology. By definition, robots are autonomous or semi-autonomous, but they don't look like robots. For example, this small cart that navigates sidewalks and people in traffic to go last mile to deliver a package. Smart technology. Driverless cars in our refrigerators that can order groceries based on the volume of a container. AI technology in a conveyor belt that knows the difference between what's recyclable, reusable, and waste. Another one is the sixth mass extinction that we are in. In 2019, last year, we saw seven more species leave this planet. In this PowerPoint, I have the Sumatran rhino that left this planet along with the white rhino, the Indian cheetah, the Chinese paddlefish, and on and on. Things that have gone extinct in our lifetime in the last 10 years are rapidly accelerating. Another element that they've identified in the age of loneliness is how humans have become so disconnected from nature. 90% of our day is spent indoors. That's over 20 days. 21.6 hours, I think it is. I bet those last few hours are spent in transition times. Times going to and from office and work and home and train. We're spending more and more time away from nature that nurtures our soul. We stop less and watch less sunsets. We stop and listen to less birds singing. We even speak less, sing less, and have less movies with nature-based elements inside them than we did 50 years ago. We're extracting ourselves from the ecosystem 
that brings us health and wellness. It's hard news, isn't it? They named it correctly, the age of loneliness. Guess what, friends? I really believe that we're one of the antidotes to this depressing, difficult time that we're in. Because what we do is create events that bring humanity, people together. We don't create meetings and events and exhibitions. We create experiences for humanity. We bring people together to inspire them, to share. Because our brain is a social brain. This thing that we have has gotten so big because of our need to be connected to others. We are hardwired for sharing and connecting and bonding with others. Our hardwiring of our brain motivates us to stay connected. We are wired to make and keep those social connections. They happen at our events. We foster them. It's embedded inside the experiences we create. When we are socially connected, when we create the ecosystems for people to gather, they're happier, healthier, they solve complex problems, they share knowledge and experience, they learn new products to be better, to be smarter, to conduct business faster. We create the ecosystem for humanity's success. Because social isolation is painful. There is a direct correlation in our brain from being socially isolated, feeling that pain socially and a connection to physically pain. So when you're feeling sad or grief during this time, think about if you sprained your wrist, the same region of the brain lights up. Be gentle with yourself. Because those social needs are part of our survival needs. All these same elements of survival needs of food, shelter, are the same connected in our social needs. So there's a real correlation to social isolation or social gathering and meeting our physical, mental needs. So what makes us people so special as species? What do you think? A, create and use language, ability to reason, having opposable thumbs, or social adaptations and needs. It's our sociality. That's why we have this big brain. That's why it's gotten so big and so complex. We speak socially, we think socially, we even dream socially. We've developed the most advanced ways of working and playing together than any other species. Friendship only exists in a few species and it's nearly universal in humans. Being human is a team sport. Things that bring us together foster collaboration, innovation, harmony, humanity, and trust. Business moves at the speed of trust. Events and exhibitions foster trust. So events are powerful forms of social influence because we're designed to be influenced by other. We take on the values and beliefs of those around us. So the events and experiences you create, you are creating a temporary ecosystem to create and foster these beliefs and trusts. We're wired to interact. We're wired to create a sense of belonging as important as a contract. So think about what you're doing in creating that sense of place for the person, sense of belonging for ourself. 
is an important role as all the other logistics that you do to create these experiences. Because our sensitivity to social rejection is our central to our well-being. Because our brain treats it as a painful event when we are socially isolated, when we don't feel like we're a part of the in crowd in our events. So here are some things to think about to deepen those social connections, whether they're live or virtual events. We are prone to have social motivations of how we enter connecting with one another through a couple, uh, through a couple things. And I'm highlighting three of them today. One is status, the feeling of importance. Com we are driven to compare ourselves to others. So, in a pre-event, whether it's live or virtual, think about through the participants' eyes. They're asking, am I prepared? Will I be embarrassed? Are others like me? Titles, disciplines, are they gathering here? Is my industry being here during the event? Sharing opinions and ideas, the dopamine rises the brain, the reward region of the brain, activates. So sharing opinions and ideas increases people's feeling of being happier, healthier, more connected. Having tweetable content, using that hashtag. If you know you have someone uh, that's a social amplifier, status is really important to them. They want to be seen as a thought leader. They want to, that's the way, their way that they get feeling of self-importance, being connected by helping others. This isn't about dominance. It's about being connected to others through how they're seen. Another way to help people be connected is certainty, predicting the future. This machine wants to do the very thing it can't, predict the future. That's one of the problems that we're dealing with right now is uncertainty. We don't know about coronavirus, what's happening next. People were trying multiple things. That uncertainty is causing us a lot of pain. So in our pre-events, really give a detailed agenda. Highlight the times that will be participatory versus listening. So people can take control over their time of what they're doing. Just like we would do with our live events. We have a full agenda, full full schedule of what's gonna happen. People can tick check what they're gonna participate in. Do that for, for the virtual events. During the event, if for virtual, have a strong moderator. Remind people where they are in the day and what you just did and what they're going to go do. Remind them what's happening, what's coming up. If there were pre-reading, if there was articles, if there's things to look at. Just like we would have an MC at an event, priming people for what to expect, reminding people what they just heard, a recap. Do that. That will bring certainty. Facts bring clarity. Facts bring consistency. So use those elements, whether they're live or virtual, in driving certainty. Another one is relatedness. In-group outbursts. Out, in, out, group. Sorry about that. A sense of belonging. Pre-event, who's coming? Will I get a chance to contribute? Where... And will I be able to share my knowledge? Are there small groups? Will I be in breakouts? Do I self-select the breakout? Am I randomly put in? I want to know who else I will be with. I want to learn from people who are like me, but I also want to learn different experiences. So when we do our breakouts during the event, making sure that we have enough similarity because similarity creates empathy, and trust. A few tips to create great brain, I'm sorry, great brain-friendly 
virtual event experience. So weird, isn't it, doing this virtual? I want to remind you what you know as an event professional. We know that we need to start with why. And why that's so important for the brain is that we need to answer what's in it for me. What will I learn? Whether it's live or virtual. So we know to ask, why are we doing this? What's happening? Because that creates the platform. Just like you wouldn't go to a hotel and be like, hmm, I wonder what kind of event I could put here. No, we create the event and then we go look for the hotel. Like we go look for the platform. Designing for who is as important. Knowing what will, what, who this is and what's their agenda. What do they need? What's the time constraints? Just like in our live events, go from large to small to large. The saliency of the brain, when we come together in the morning, our brain is fresh. Our emotions are high. Bring that togetherness in that large event. Going down in the day, our brain gets tired. Part of the brain that's our braking system starts to wear out. We have less self-control. We want, we want it, we're more um, uh, sensitive to threat. So putting people in large groups is very threatening to the brain. We're smaller, I can see people, I can connect with them more, I can see their names. And then end with that larger group where we're, our brain actually increases towards the end of event. Our emotional saliency rises, our social saliency rises. As we know, beginning sets the tone. The ending is what people remember. So end with high emotion or poignancy. That will ignite the brain region and anchor in the short-term memory. Agenda and timing. Mornings, I call it strategic attention. When we've eaten, we have this beautiful chemicals inside of our body. And the brain is happy. It's full of nutrients. We like 20 minutes of concentration. Coming down and looking into a screen takes a lot of focus, strategic attention. The brain can do that in the morning. It hasn't worn out. In the afternoon, it's a great time for social learning, panels, breakouts, case studies, peer-to-peer -peer learning, things that allow our brain to go into a 180 peripheral view and think about and do inward thinking. If you're doing a stacking of 20 minute sessions, so call them the TED Talks, one right after another, put a 45 second intermission. It's restorative. And tell people, take your video off, get up, stretch, take three deep breaths, go wash your hands. <laughs> yes, in this cleanliness moment. But why is when we wa run warm water over our hands, the parasympathetic system activates. That's part of the reward region of the brain, and we feel better. Cognitive breaks. Something is better than nothing. Telling people we're going to take a 15-minute break, an hour lunch, put your, put your, um, Take your video off and put it on your on your on your picture. Sorry about that. Something is better than nothing. Giving them permission and telling them. Moving beats stationary. Even if it's a moment of just standing up and stretching, dropping your pencil. As you drop the pencil, bend over, pick it up, inhale, go to the ceiling, write one word that you thought of and as you do so, exhale. That 30 second intermission, moving beats stationary, helps the brain and the body. It anchors in that short term memory. Social beats solo. So making sure there are times for people to share ideas. Lastly, outside beats inside. So reminding people during that lunch break, go outside. Give them a sensory exercise. Come back and share with a partner one thing that you saw from the sky 
one thing that you smelled that was different from the environment you were in, one thing that felt different. A sensory exercise really helps bring the outside inside. And that creates a better wellness and better thinking and feeling. 2.55 p.m. Please remember this. It is the worst time of day for our brain. The brain energy goes right down. It's the lowest dip of our emotional and cognitive brain. 2.55, and we know this. When do we hold most breaks in the afternoon? 2.30 to 3, 3 to 3.30, right in that sweet spot. We know this, but 2.55 is the lowest point of our brain to take in more information, to be more engaged, to listen, to activate, to participate. It needs to decongest. It needs to decompress. It needs to have a moment to breathe. And 2.55 is that sweet spot. I recently saw something where it really brought to light a lot of what we're going through. And I really thought about it as an event professional. And I wrote it down in my journal. I keep a journal, a nature journal, a number of different journals. And I have a cognitive journal. And I wrote this down and I took a picture of it. And this is what it said. And I thought, to need others is often defined as a failure when that's the very fibers of, the, of life that holds us together. We are all one. We are connected. The work we do as event professionals is so important to the world. It fosters humanity, it brings humanity together, and it will be part of an antidote for the age of loneliness that we are in. Keep doing what you're doing. You are vital to the success of humanity. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you contribute. And thank you for bringing yourself to the world. You matter to us. Thank you. Hi, everybody. And um, what we're going to do now, following on from Janet's great session from Edu Monday, uh, Janet didn't have the opportunity to actually answer some of your questions. So what we've done is we're doing a 12 minute recording here for all of you to hear some of the answers to probably some of the questions that you actually put to Janet on the day. So Janet, welcome and thanks so much for coming back for the Q&A with us. Of course, it's Dale Hudson and it's IMAX. I'm happy to help out. Thank you. Oh, lovely. So, Janet, we've, we've got three questions here and we're going to try and keep it to 12 minutes because we don't want, um, you know, hopefully people have got themselves a drink, they're feeling relaxed and they can just sit and listen to this in a nice, calm and um, peaceful way. So, cheers. <laughs> cheers. <laughs> I've got an empty glass of water here, so I won't do that right now. <laughs> so, um, right. So, we have, we, the first question we have is, do you think this time period of social distancing will help us to value human connections more in the future? Yes, I think it already has. I know for me, like in my slides, I say, who was the last person you hugged and <clears throat> before COVID that you don't live with? Like just that simple question. I know for myself, I had to go back into my calendar and look. And yes, I think, you know, we crave human connections psychologically, physically. And so we're somewhat in deprivation. And so we are hungry and thirsty for contact with others. Um, and so we, there'll, I think there will definitely be uh, a driving force beyond what we've seen normally from getting together from our experience of events, of learning, networking, and doing business. I think there's going to be a lot of people looking to taking that networking like a sponge and squeeze the water out so that they get every last drop. So I think in the beginning, these interactions that we have are going to be intimate. People are going to look each other in the eye and really sort of explore them as a person because we have been in a drought and the rains, when they come, we are going to lap it up and it won't be taken for granted. I think that's the other part. Because we know what it's like without it, when we get back to it, it's sort of like, you know, having that first 
uh, thing that you, if you went on a diet or you stopped doing something and then you went and did it, you're like, oh my God, that was so great. You know, you took yourself to a spa after, you know, whatever it might be, you relish the, the small things more. And I think that's what it'll come by, which I think for our industry really adds things like how do we accentuate those moments and offer opportunities more where it's not so constructed, where people can go off script and not pe pe meet people they normally would meet. No, I fully agree with you. And I know I'm massively craving a bit of human connection at the moment. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, let's, let's look forward to that one. Uh, right, going on to our second question. Do you think we'll see a spike in event attendance because people crave to see each other? My heart says yes. My head says, hmm. Because here's the things. Economics. Will businesses have people, the funding to send them? I think that will be the reality. I think the reality of, will people know that they're being safe and, you know, what measures have been done in their physical environment of where they're staying, where they're meeting, how, do, how are things taken up so that they are, really are safe in their area? Yeah. No. What do you think? I, I'm going to agree with you there. I think, you know, I think people want it. They really want it really badly. And, um, and I think that they will make business decisions very, very wisely as well. You know, where they're going to get value, where are they going to go? So I think that those are the, the things that people will be looking at because, um, you know, budgets are not going to be as, as big probably as they have been. So um, we can look at the personal side and the way our brains want and crave it, but then you've got to look at the business side and say, oh, you know, what, what, what is reasonable to do now? Yep. Yep, exactly. I think, I think so too. Yep. Yeah. So... Um, what uh, this is our final question actually what changes will attendees be looking for at events in the future i think they're going to be looking for communication of what is happening to keep them safe we are driven first and foremost as humans by a threat we respond to threat first before re uh, reward happiness safety all of those or I'm not, it's not safety. Um, so we as an industry need to be very clear when we communicate to attendees, not just the objectives, the dates, the location, all the through. We have to be very clear in our communication of what standards that we hold in whether it's through the facilities that we're holding it or we as, as the event organizer, what are we doing to keep people safe in the environments that we are bringing them together in? whether it's on the buses, in dining, in the, you know, in the uh, meeting rooms. Like we need to communicate that because that's weighing on their mind because we're coming from a place of stay safer at home, social distancing, um, being isolated. It's a slow, it'll be a slow growth coming back. Information brings clarity. Information, uh, real data and information really builds that, that, um, uh, reward of what our brain needs. We feel happy when we have information. So I really think, you know, for the attendees, they're going to want that. And then for the experience itself, they're going to want to have moments where they can just relax and feel safe and really connect. So how do we do that? What do we do? Do our town halls and our uh, exhibition halls become bigger because there's social distancing, but places for people to really gather? That net square, net square footage is as important as the booth to the attendee. So I think we really have to look at what do we do, whether it's a trade show or in a meeting room uh, or in that, in that convention center or, or, or hotel, to have common space for people to gather. And we can't look at it as show organizers as space that doesn't add value or space that doesn't bring value of, of objectives. So we really need to look at how we do that because people are going to crave it more. Yeah, I agree with you. I suppose also we need to think about the venues. You know, the venues are going to be doing a lot of work around this as well because, of course, they realize that this is a, you know, it's going to have a huge impact on people booking with them. Do you, do you, what do you think that venues could possibly be bringing in to help the attendees to feel a little bit more 
even if it's psychological in a way, but sometimes sure. it is, isn't it? But how, how, how could they help to make people feel safer, I believe? You know, adopting standards. We're seeing more and more standards roll out uh, every day, every week around um, uh, safety and biosecurity, safety and security. Adapt those standards. Um, and so because they're, they're, uh, they're starting to be, a, it's a global brand, it'll be important. We recognize brands for a reason and we trust brands that we see all the time. So really use those and communicate that. And I think facilities that do that will really help people understand how do I prepare to come to that facility? Will I get my temperature checked? Will I have to wear a mask? What, what are they doing to help keep my hands clean? Like how are they cleaning their, their facilities? Um, and I think that, that will really help accelerate people coming back into the market, coming back into, into life with each other. Yeah, no, I, I'm fully agreeing with you on that one. Um, is there anything else, Janet, that you want to say that you think sort of the IMEX audience would be interested to hear? Um, you know, the, I've done a fair amount of interviews over the last three, four weeks around virtual meetings and, and, and this. And as show organizers, as event professionals, don't forget who you are and the skills you have. No matter what platform we use, live or virtual, still go back to what are the objectives? Because the virtual platform can, is as nuanced as the live experience, looking at the facilities, what platform, who needs to be there, what kind of conversations need to happen. Instead of having room breakouts, we have moderators in the breakouts. Like still bring all those skills that you have, all that planning of critical, still bring them because the virtual platform is as nuanced as the live platform. So keep doing what you're doing and be who you are. And please go out and continue getting education around this. We're all learning. And there are, there are people out there that can really help us look at what do we do? How do we do this better? Because at the end of the day, we need to bring value to people and value to their business. And so stay who you are, stay what you do, and keep thinking about how do we help people connect, grow, and do business better. And that will really help. Oh, thanks, Janet. And that's really lovely, wise words to end this um, interview with. So thank you so much. And we really appreciate you coming back to do this recording with us. Uh, it's a pleasure. To Dale, always, of course. Thank you.